Okay, the next topic is OJAS in relation to diet and celibacy. It's a very good question. Um, but before we talk about OJAS, we have to remind ourselves that what OJAS is and its relationship to uh, two other sort of inseparable and indispensable qualities of consciousness in the body, such as prana and tejas. But first about ojas. Ojas is immunological substance of consciousness, which is basically a byproduct of the progressive transformation of anything that we've been eating as it goes through the gradual digestion through various bodily tissues. Ayurveda has a very large part dedicated to ojas because essentially according to Ayurveda the health of the individual is being viewed as ojas which means immunological substance of consciousness at its prime as opposed to ama which means wasted indigested food as toxins this, those two stand in the opposition to each other completely the uh, two very different expressions or just is something that has been successfully digested and turned into consciousness on physiological level or like essence of consciousness on physiological level and ama is something which has, has been indigested undigested sorry and turn into toxins which pollutes clogs the body and leads to its illness and decay now um, perhaps we will leave the actual process of formation of ojas or just mention it maybe in, few, in, a, in a nutshell that all the food that we eat goes through the successive stages of digestion through all the seven dhatus or seven tissues such as plasma, blood, muscle, fat, bone, bone marrow and until it becomes ojas. So ojas is right next to bone marrow. Bone marrow uh, literally feeds ojas but before the food that we eat turns to ojas it has to go through all successive stages of that digestion without any impediment without any delay, without any block until it becomes our substance which supports us immunologically that's what ojas in its essence so diet obviously is incredibly important it's paramount, what we eat will contribute to the development of ojas or contribute towards development of ama towards development of toxins so, obviously, uh, each of us has to know our, our own constitutional setup in order to be able to uh, choose the right food, you know, the right regimen, style, the way we eat, you know, the seasons, what have you. All this play a tremendous role uh, in the way our physiology utilizes the energy with which we feed itself. So, how does this all just relate to the spiritual practice? For instance, the difference between viewing of ojas in Ayurveda and the role of the ojas in yoga is that Ayurveda is about balance in the body and it is as if remaining in a status quo. Ayurveda is not so much about reaching enlightenment or seeking the transformative processes but to find as much balance as possible on physiological level so that there is discrepancies and disturbances in the, between the mind and the body are being breached and the natural state of sattva being achieved whereby ojas is that necessary necessary drive which uh, imbibes or that substance which imbibes our 
faculties, all our faculties, mental, physiological, emo you know, emotional, immunological, with that um, essence which supports it on all levels. And that's what Ojas is. However, in yoga, Ojas plays a slightly different role. Because in yoga, Ojas is interlinked with Prana and Tejas. And what is Ojas, Tejas and Prana according to the yogic terminology? Ojas, Tejas and Prana are subtle essences of water, air and fire. Whereby Ojas is a subtle essence of water, pra Prana is the subtle essence of air and Tejas is subtle essence of fire. So, in order for the transformative processes successfully take place in the body, all these three need to be developed. And yogis do their utmost to pay attention to the proper development of Tejas, Ojas and Prana. Why? Because Prana, as an air, vital air, that moves everything in the body, corresponds to the nervous system. Tejas corresponds to that inner heat, necessarily for transformative, transmutative processes. It's that inner fire. And Ojas is that oil, that substance, that oil, that allows, allows the fire to burn. So you see, it's like a simple relationship, you know. You have something, you know, you have that lamp, which has an oil, which has a wick, which has a flame, and needs oxygen in order for the flame to burn. In the same way, the burning of spiritual transformation is uh, replicated in that manner in the human physiology. So the relationship between Ojas, Tejas, and Prana is paramount. Because if there is, let's say, a shortage of one, it will impede the function of the other. Or likewise, if there is overactivity of one at the expense of the other, if there is too much tejas, it will burn, literally, it will burn ojas very quickly. If there is too much prana in the body, it might blow off the tejas, will never allow that flame to um, function in its proper fashion, in its proper strength. And if there is not enough ojas, then what is there to burn? What is there to, you know, oil all this process? And that process needs to be oiled because ojas is literally the fuel of all these transmutative processes. Ojas is that which will allow the transformation of consciousness to take place in the body. Thence, prana, tejas and ojas are intimate, intimately interlinked. And also we need to mention that the prana, ojas and tejas are present in a normal human being, in the human being in whom, in whom consciousness is in a dormant state. However, it is still in a gross state. It's in a gross level. So ojas is gross, it needs to be purified and rarefied. Tejas is still gross, it's still on the level of digestive fire only. You know, like Jagrat Agni and uh, Jnana Agni. It's still on the um, gross level. You know, the fire of digestion and fire of comprehension is still on the basic level. It needs to be turned into that fire of knowledge it needs to be turned into that fire which basically um, consumes the individual towards the love of God, towards the love of the self, towards the love of, of that which one is and one becomes. And likewise, um, prana needs to be purified because prana is still gross in the human body. The air, air we breathe, it's the grossest expression of prana 
that we deal with when we talk about prana in its very, very refined state. The prana becomes refined through the practice of pranayama. Prana becomes rarefied through the practice of spontaneous, spontaneous um, with, with withdrawal of the breath or the uh, retain of the breath. Not done like, you know, superficially by forcibly retaining the breath because very little you can do, you know, like you can hold the breath for only one minute, up maximum three minutes, and that's it, you know, like. But in the awakened individual, in the awakened physiology, the, these processes are elongated in much, much more subtle. So, prana is being purified through the spontaneous pranayama and through the alter all alternations and alterations of the breath patterns. Tejas is being purified through the burning desire for liberation. It's that necessarily drive. Without a proper amount of tejas, there is no motivation on spiritual path. You know, and all this sort of like um, kind of ready-made, non-dualist, uh, neo-advaita concepts that like we all are realized are an excuses to throw you back uh, into the basically a tamasic state of consciousness, into the inertia that nothing needs to be done. It's you know like all this is consciousness in the proper uh, spiritual community. It is known from the start that all this is one. And we are one, I'm you, you are me. However, the work needs to be done. Nobody is going to do this work for us. Thence, development of Tejas is literally through the power of inquiry, through the power of investigation, through the power of discrimination. That rarefies and purifies Tejas from the mere intellectualizing through a mere in, you know, in, inquiry into the, what happens in, you know, on the surface of the world, on the surface of the, um, let's say, um, on, the, on the apparent level of uh, knowledge. We're not talking about, the, you know, Tejas is not increased by just gobbling down, let's say, uh, information. That's not Tejas. Tejas is increased through the power of self-inquiry through the power of investigation and discrimination, which is always addressed within. And Ojas is purified through devotion, through the act of feeling, because there's direct correlation between Ojas as a mineralogical substance and our ability to feel minutest and the most subtlest forms of expression on the level of the feeling. Feelings are most important. You know, all these subtle feelings are most important. It is very important that we do not discard these feelings, that we are tuned to what we feel deep within our heart. That develops and purifies ojas. And devotion is one of the primal uh, expressions which allows our power of our ojas to reach its rarefied, most rarefied, rarefied state. Because let's face it, all this talks about love, all this talk, talks about, you know, that everything is love and, you know, like love all there is. Your body, your physiology has, actually has to have enough subtle substance which oils that feeling of love. You cannot, cannot intellectually love somebody. It is a natural, spontaneous processes. And it is born from the ability, ability of the body to love, because that, that ojas is what carries intimately, intimately, allows the natural, spontaneous expression of love to be felt toward, towards every living creature and ultimately towards the whole of creation regardless of its state and status. So yes, going back to the original question, Ojas in its relation to diet and celibacy. 
celibacy, since we kind of mentioned diet, and this is not exactly the talk where we you know, go into the aspects of um, food in detail, we just agree that diet is paramount to the success. But when we talk about celibacy, what do we understand by celibacy? Obviously, celibacy is the preservation of that essence known as ojas. Because ojas, ojas being the immunological substance respons responsible for sustaining all our systems uh, and, and functioning at its up optimum, is also a reproductive fluid. So ojas fulfills that role at once. It sustains us as well as allows for the reproduction to take place. It is expressed in the male as semen and reproductive fluid in the female body. So depletion of ojas, overexpenditure in sexual activity where you discharge your semen or reproductive fluid naturally leads to the drying of the system. Your system becomes less, less imbibed with that substance which is necessary for the transformative process to take place in a progressive fashion, in a progressive manner. Otherwise, what will happen is that OJAS has to always, always takes its amount and it will literally take the nutrients necessary from its next tissue. It will take the nutrients from bone marrow, right? Because that's the one that precedes OJAS. And the bone marrow will be depleted. Depleted bone marrow necessarily would have to draw nutrients and goodness from bone. And bone would have to take that from the next tissue. So the, you see the whole body, the whole physiology is actually, would be under, under tremendous stress. And that's what it is. Overindulgence in sex creates stress on physiology and its nervous system. So celibacy understood properly, it's not actually a, a kind of a monk, a monk lifestyle, you know, the nun's lifestyle where you say no to your um, bodily urges and tie a ribbon there. It's not going to help because on a subtle level, you know, you, you may tie the ribbon here tight, sit yourself in uh, Siddhasana, what have you, lock yourself with bandas and, you know, wear all this, you know, loincloth like in India men wear in order, for, in order never to experience the erection, you know, they tie, tie it so tight so that like, you know, it doesn't allow that natural spontaneous flow of desire on a you know, lower level. But what will happen is that the desire will go into a subtler region and that where the leakage will take place. So you may not actually lose ojas necessarily through a physiological act of copulation, but you will lose ojas because ojas doesn't just exist in terms of, let's say, as something, you know, substantial. It exists also on a subtle level, on a very subtle level, on an extremely subtle level, where it is beyond the physical actual manifestation, it's beyond the, the fluid, beyond that kind of substance. And that's where you will lose ojas, you will lose it on a subtle level, because that's where it will leak into all these desires, into all these, you know, projections. Because, it, you know, sex will happen in the head then. The desire will haunt one in the head. So that's why the very fine balance have to be fine, found, how to um, juggle this whole thing. You need to learn a lot about your own physiology in order to be able to harmoniously somehow to sustain uh, this process of um, expansion of consciousness 
and the necessity of bodily fluids to support that process with your still earthly bodily urges and desires because not everyone experiences spontaneous withdrawal and brahmachari you know like spontaneous brahmachari is a blessing of course who told you know like the, the you know there's no doubt about it that if you have this spontaneous withdrawal from this activity you know you're blessed if you have this sublimation within but many of us are don't many of us are not so many of us have to deal with the physiology so true meaning of celibacy is that fine balance where consciousness is always uprising it's not sustenance from sex as such you can still enjoy physical pleasure as long as there's the measure in terms of you not overexpanding yourself and of course a subtle knowledge on what to eat immediately let's say the morning after or the uh, soon after the sexual act you know like if you know that certain food uh, almost immediately restores orgias you know all this is necessarily so i hope this kind of like um, um puts it in pers- into perspective but we need to understand the difference in that um ojas and its role in ayurveda in the life of the householder of everyone and the role of ojas for some, someone who is in the process of yogic transformation it's because yoga utilizes um prana while ayurveda utilizes agni the digestive fire so this is the subtle difference you know where ayurvedic aim is to sustain balance by proper digestion and then the god of ayurveda or like you know the the main deity is agni you know, if you have healthy agni then you are healthy individual and in yoga it is the subtle air the vayu the prana is being utilized and the main deity is prana in yoga the main vehicle is prana so because the, in order for the transmutative processes to take place you need to have realignment activation purification and gradual withdrawal of prana and where tejas and ojas are necessarily components which are intimately interlinked in that like equilateral like relationship you know which each side of it is completely even you know whichever way you turn it it has that kind of uh, either steady you know pyramid like shiva symbol or you know when turned down it represents shakti in its active form